marketing and here we are with our July webinar uh, that is about a topic that we talk about a lot and we've been talking more about it lately which is just marketing mistakes that we see continually happening all the time and uh, we just wanted to we got a big presentation here and I've got Danielle Rudiman here to present it thank you Danielle for putting it together you're very welcome and Jamie Kelly, who's one of our web analysts, very smart guy. Jamie, thanks for joining us. And of course, our SEO manager, Laura Johnson, is here to make sure that we don't tell you any lies and to <laughs> also add her own horror stories of what she's seen from clients. We won't mention any names unless it's appropriate to. Um, but yeah, this is going to be a great uh, session. So. Don't forget the, the rules here. we got about an hour, and we're going to try and keep on that schedule out of respect to your time. Uh, this is being recorded, so we will be able to send the uh, webinar out to you uh, with the presentation and whatever else materials that, that you need. Um, let me just real quick um, make an announcement. If you haven't checked uh, about the Great Legal Marketing Summit here in October, uh, you should go to glmsummit.com and get more information about that. That's uh, something that we always participate in every year, hosted by Ben Glass and, um, and Great Legal Marketing. And we'll teach you all things about marketing. And we're doing our boot camp right afterwards. So if you're interested in getting in on that boot camp, it's that Sunday as usual. And more information is coming out about that. But you can go register there at fwmbootcamp.com too. So I'll just make those two quick announcements. Uh, and then the last thing is, uh, no doubt you're going to have questions. So uh, when you have a question, there's a little uh, area down there in your GoTo meeting or GoTo webinar control panel uh, where you can input your question and we will answer them um, when appropriate. Okay. So uh, without further ado, Danielle, thank you very much. Let's get started. Oh, you're in yes. control. Well, that's true. I'm running the show here. All right. I think I am at least. There we go. All right. So what are you going to learn today? So we had some discussions on what, if we were going to highlight some of the big marketing mistakes we're seeing, what should we highlight? And this is what we came up with. This is not everything that could possibly ever go wrong with your marketing. These are just the big ones that we're seeing and why we wanted to do uh, a webinar on this topic this month. And in these are in no particular order, but the first thing you'll learn today is how failing to promote your content can doom your marketing and what you can do about it why you're failing at social media and what to do. And if you have no content focus or hyper focus, how can you balance your keyword use? You're also going to hopefully learn how to quit those random acts of marketing you're doing and start working on a plan. And you're also going to learn that you need to measure what you're doing. And there's no excuses for this, right, Jamie? Absolutely. All right. So the first item here, you write content. Everybody writes content. We talk to a lot of attorneys and doctors who write their own content or they pay someone to do it, uh, but they're frustrated with the results. The reason is you fail to promote it. So here's the scenario. You write content for your website. Perhaps you even add a free offer to your website, which is what we recommended. And we just did a webinar about this two months ago. And then you wait. And you wait. You're sitting there waiting for people to come, get your offer, read your content, and nothing happens. So what happens? What's the result? What do we hear all the time? Well, we hear the content doesn't work and, and free offers are a waste. And, you know, this is no different than a store opening up and never advertising that the store exists. I mean, how do you expect to draw people in? And you, they have to put ads out there. They have to make announcements. You know, even existing uh, mega stores, Walmart, will announce that they're opening up a new store. we got a Wegmans opening up close to us. We've all, all been waiting for it because they're putting the time into the announcement of the new service or the new store or whatever. And you're right, we see this all the time, that it doesn't work and they just, uh, people just add, and it doesn't matter whether you're with us or anybody or what you do, you just add some content to the website and expect people to come. Like, that's like opening a window and expecting a bluebird to fly in. So that's just not realistic. All right, so what can we do about this? So the solution is when you publish content or you put that free offer on your website, you then need to actually promote it. You need to go actively look for people to come read your content or download that offer. So, Danielle, I'd like to just compliment you on all the fancy images that you've got in this presentation this time. And I just want to let everybody know that there's a lot of fancy coming up here in this presentation. <laughs> Google image. 
All right, so what's our solution? You need to have a plan to promote your key pieces. And you have many ways that you can reach out and talk to potential clients or people who have expressed an interest in you. You've got social media, and it's not just posting content to your Facebook page. You can do paid ads, which, Jamie, I think we've seen some success with those. Uh, there are also groups in social media that you can post to that are relevant to what you're doing. You can also tag other people, and we're going to show some examples a little later on. If you're doing an email newsletter, which we hope you are, you can include blurbs about your content and send people back to the website. You can also include um, your information in the print newsletter, and you can send people back to your site for more information, so email and print. If you're doing follow-up campaigns, we recommend you keep those campaigns up to date. So, for example, if you do a campaign about motorcycle accidents because somebody downloaded a book or got a bumper sticker, if you write a new article or get some new statistics, go into your follow-up campaign and update it and send people back to your website to that fresh article. Again, it's just another way to get eyeballs on that, that piece of content. We also want you to link back to your article from other newsletters. So, for example, we write newsletter copy for uh, some of our partners. You can do that as well if you work with uh, other people in your community, other businesses. Those business owners uh, or those organizations may have their own newsletter and you can contribute content and link it back to your website. You can also comment on relevant forums or answer Avo questions and send people back to your site. Yeah, I mean, when we're saying promote your content, we're just talking about getting links to your content, right, guys? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can go about it through social media and some of these other online channels that Jamie has mentioned. Uh, they can all be very effective, especially when you need to in conjunction with each other. Uh, you don't want to limit yourself to just one avenue uh, by diversifying where you Yeah, if we spend a lot of time, for example, we do app marketing ourselves. Um, if we spend a lot of time on an article and have something we put a lot of effort into, we'll put it out on social media. And you don't have to do it just once. You can do it a couple times. We'll also include a blurb about it in our email newsletter. And then we'll also have a summary in the print newsletter. So we try to, if we have a really good piece we want to promote, we find multiple ways to get it out there. And you can do the same thing. Yeah, and I mean, I guess that that's what I'm saying is instead of doing, you know, shady backlinks to get links that are irrelevant, right? Laura, this is the way to get good quality links that are relevant to your site. Right. Start with your own stuff that you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. We see this all the time, though. We see where people instead choose to do black hat or buy links or participate in, you know, in schemey directories and all that stuff or go, you know, spend good money on useless link building mm -hmm. when all they have to do is utilize their own efforts. Right, exactly. And take advantage of those outlets that are immediately available to you to promote that. And especially ones if you already have a following of, you know, clients that have uh, been following you for a while, people that are already interested in what you're promoting. Okay. Well, let's keep going here. All right, and there's a couple different kinds of content. So when we talk about content, we want you to think about ways to use these types. You've got your evergreen content, uh, which is content that can kind of stand the test of time. Uh, it's facts, library information, things like that. And you can reuse it and keep it updated on your website, especially if it's really niched or really focused, or if it's seasonal. You may write about accidents that happened during a certain time of year. Or, Jamie, I know we've talked a little about DUI attorneys, where certain types of cases come up at certain times of the year. Yeah, you know, it's very interesting and probably not that surprising in hindsight, but you go back and look at, if we're using the example of DUI attorneys, uh, go back and look at the past year of your traffic, for instance, in analytics. What we see uh, a lot of the time is that traffic for DUI attorneys spikes on July 5th, on uh, the day after Thanksgiving, in the time between Christmas and New Year's. If you ask any attorney, any DUI attorney, when they do most of their business, they're probably going to tell you that those are very popular times for DUI cases. But it's important to remember to think of marketing as part of the greater whole. You know when seasonally the best cases are coming in, and there's no reason not to be incorporating that information into your marketing plan. Right, so that's your evergreen content. If you've got content that is appropriate for that seasonal change or that, that event, you know, freshen it up and use it, put it back out there. You don't need to write uh, another article about about that. You can just update what you already have and use it. 
Real quick on this, um, one of our uh, great clients and good friends, Jeffrey Meldon, who is down in Gainesville and does personal injury and DUI, MeldonLaw.com. He does a uh, scholarship program every year, and he's been doing it before the internet existed. Um, and that's something that you know he pumps out and just you know brings it up uh, and refreshes it every year. And that's a, that's an example of that. That's you know, and that's even that that hits a couple different things because that's his own scholarship program, and 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 you should be doing that. It's a great thing to do. Um, uh, but it's just a, another way, and as Jamie said, you know, July 4th, you know, when accidents happen or during the summer, um, you know, talk about things that typically happen during the summer, um, during the holidays, those kinds of things. I mean, you want to make sure that you, um, and of course, attaching yourself to what's going on um, in breaking news. There's always something going on. There's always people getting hurt. Uh, just because it's not right in your backyard doesn't mean that you shouldn't be talking about it. That's what people are talking about. That's what the whole social media experience is, and you need to be participating in that because if you're not, you're because your competitors are, and if you're not, they're going to get the attention where you're not going to. So we just wanted to differentiate between these two types of content: the evergreen, where it's a really good, high-quality article that can stand the test of time and be reused and updated over and over, and breaking news, where you're trying to capitalize on a hot topic, something that's out there in the news. And you can hit it hard through all your marketing, but you don't necessarily need to keep that updated. If you're talking about uh, an accident event or something in the news, you can let that die. Yeah. And I found this. I think this is one of the worst slides I've ever seen, but it amused me last night, so I stuck it in here. And uh, it's just kind of a reminder to you, go beyond just blogging. There's so many different kinds of content that you can create for your website beyond just putting out a blog. So we want you to think about using testimonials, really good testimonials from your patients and clients. You want to write up case studies and talk about the types of people that you've helped and turn that into really awesome content. You want to do frequently asked questions. That's wonderful content. You can also do write about current news events. You can make videos. Is there anything else you can toss out there? Uh, I would like to reiterate the case studies idea uh, because general consensus for several years is that then has been that internet attention spans are are very short and people aren't interested in super in-depth, super long uh, pieces of content. And uh, a lot of the times that's generally true. People are looking for easily and quickly digestible pieces of information. Uh, that said, however, there's also a very large market uh, for extremely in-depth, extremely well thought out, well researched, pseudo academic case studies and white papers being published. Google views articles uh, of that caliber and of that length uh, very favorably. They tend to give them a lot of authority and they can be very beneficial to your rankings long term more so than you know a dozen sort of phoned in blog posts over the course of a month. Uh, there are a lot more work uh, creating these longer studies, uh, probably not for everybody, but if you're sort of academically inclined to begin with, this can be a great way to spend your time and also get some uh, some return on your marketing uh, long term. Yeah, we find when we write the longer pieces, we spend more time promoting them. We put more effort into promoting them, and that's probably why they do much better. But people are hungry for good information. I know I myself enjoy the longer pieces because I'm so tired of short, thin content. All right. Yeah, I mean, it's the times have changed, obviously, again, about content. It's not just about content for the sake of it, but putting content up there that people want to read that you're going to be proud of. I mean, that's really why there's author tags now and why Google wants you to put your name next to content and why Google is not just taking and indexing all of your content no matter what you put up there. It's looking, really looking for the best. All right, we're done with the lady with the needle. Okay. So the next item on our agenda here is your social media isn't social at all. All right. So our scenario, so you or the folks you're outsourcing your social media to are just auto posting content to your social media pages, or even if they're doing it by hand, they're just posting content from your website and off they run. That's it. That's your social media. Or maybe you just hang out on Google Plus with all the other lawyers. You guys are fooling each other. All right. So what's the result here? So if you're doing social media this way, you're going to have few clients who like your pages or follow you, few likes or comments on your posts because people just aren't engaged, and you're not going to have a lot of people following your posts back to your website. And what's your, the conclusion you're going to reach? Well, social media just doesn't work. And this is one we hear all the time as well. 
So what's our solution? We want you to embrace the social nature of social media. And this is one where you're going to have to do a little work. We want you to look at your process when you're handling your clients or your patients. Where in your life cycle does it make sense to invite them to follow you or like you on social media so you can keep in touch with them? Uh, so work that into your process, either in the exit process when they're leaving, invite them to stay in touch with you, or when they first sign on so that they can keep in touch. You know, find a way to work this in your process so you're always asking your uh, current clients to stay in touch. That's going to help you naturally grow the number of people keeping in touch with you on social media. You also want to give these followers a reason to pay attention, and you do that by providing them with great information. It's, social media is another form of content, but it shouldn't just be articles about accidents or surgeries or anything like that. If you can find a way to, to provide local and personalized information, you know, make it personal, make it interesting, you're going to get more interactions. Another thing that you can do, and we'll show you this on the next slide, is you can comment on other business pages. So you can get involved with other businesses in your areas or businesses that are similar to you and uh, try to get in front of some additional people that way. So let's take a look at that. So here's an example from Hubie and Abraham. They sponsored the Winterset Bike Night, and you can see in the post, I've got the screenshot here on the right, that they've actually, Hubie and Abraham, this is their business page, and they've tagged this um, community or business page, the Winterset Bike Night, and this will uh, get this post in front of the folks on the Winterset Bike Night. It's another way just to get more exposure. So one th good thing for you to know on Facebook is as a business, you can tag other businesses or other organizations in your posts. You just can't tag people. So here's a good example of Hubie and Abraham's working with these folks. So they do a post, they tag the other company. And this is a good way, if you do work with charities, you work with other businesses, this is a good way to get in front of their followers. Hubie does a great job at this. They do, really do a fantastic job with their social media. Um, and they're a big, giant law firm. Um, but they do it very well, and they get a lot of attention, and they get a lot of contacts. Yeah, they're very involved in their community. Yes, That's really key. And they're genuine. That's the other thing, too, is they don't just phone it in. They're, they're out there on the street. They're really helping out, um, and they're just talking about what they do. They do a lot of promotions like this that are very successful. Yeah, you'll see a lot of pictures of them with their fans at uh, charity events with the bumper stickers and T-shirts and things like that, so they're very involved. And the difference between you guys and them is that they just – they actually do it, and they don't talk about it. I mean, they talk about it, but they execute it. They've got a great marketing team over there, um, great firm. All right. So we just talked about this. As a business page, you can tag other businesses and community pages to get more exposure. Here's an example again. Foster Web Marketing as a business page can tag a law office site. So again, you can talk to other businesses this way. So I definitely encourage you to check this out. Like I said, you can't tag people, but we have kind of a way around that. I think that's the next slide. And you can promote, you know, like other businesses that you work with and encourage that they promote you too. I mean, right. that's the whole point, you know. Something as simple as, uh, this is, Jamie, this is some stuff that we recommended for Kasama, which is a court reporting company uh, that's in Old Town. And there's a bunch of great restaurants and uh, hotels and stuff in Old Town. And so they can put something out there if they're coming in, if people are coming into town, uh, you, they could be exposed to all this. Old Town is a really cool place to be, and they're down there, so they could be exposed to all these other businesses. And so helping you promoting other businesses that you work with, restaurants that you like to eat at, or that you recommend, because they're going to ask you anyway, uh, encourages them to, to promote you. And so maybe if they're, if a lawyer's in town dealing with, you know, with another law firm or with another uh, court reporting company, and they go eat at a restaurant that you recommend, and they happen to hear you talking them talking about court reporting, they could recommend you. So you just don't know how it's going to work, and this is not that much effort, and it's more genuine. <clears throat> yeah, tagging other businesses when you're talking about them online has the very functional purpose of getting your posts in front of more eyeballs, because when you tag uh, some other local business that you happen to be talking about or working with, that post is seen not only by your followers, but also by their followers. Um, but to a greater degree, it's part of what uh, one of the points that we've talked about a lot over the past year, and that's being a good online neighbor. You're going the extra mile to tag these people. Uh, if general rule, if you're referencing somebody or there's or, a neighbor at the door. Yeah, if you're get into the habit of if you're participating in social media and talking about somebody, whether it's uh, an individual or a business, tag them. It's considered almost rude online behavior to mention somebody by name without tagging them because then they're not seeing that you're talking about them. 
social media, social etiquette. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very good. All right, so we were just talking about how, as a business, you can uh, tag other businesses, and you may want to actually tag the individuals. Uh, so what you can do is, you can see in this example, we posted about a new website we launched for The Body You Want, which is a gym in DC. Uh, but what I did is I commented on the post, so I, as myself, can comment, and I can tag uh, my employees, I can tag people I'm friends with. So if you are personally friends with folks in your community or other business owners, or even if you happen to friend some of your clients, which I know some of you do, you can tag them this way and get their attention. Now it's not in your main post, but it is in the comments. You can draw people into the comments by uh, talking to them or complimenting them and things like that. So don't be afraid to try to engage a conversation. Again, it is social media. If there's folks you want to come see something or if you want to have them comment, give their opinion, you can do it this way. We also encourage you to look for social media sites that develop communities. Uh, Google Plus has a lot of communities out there. You know, we ourselves join communities for lawyers and doctors, and we keep an eye on the conversations there. LinkedIn does this as well. There are a lot of communities you can join, and you may be able to find some that are relevant to the type of law or the type of medicine that you practice. And then there are places like Avo, which allows you as an attorney to answer questions that people post. Uh, so there are other sites like that where you can just get engaged in the community way and provide helpful information, and that's going to give you exposure as well. Uh, you can also follow local businesses on Twitter. Depending on your community and the type of um, social media outreach they're doing, you may find that some of the people in your area are very active on Twitter. And um, this can be, you know, it is hard sometimes for lawyers and doctors to be successful on Twitter, but it can be done. And I've included a couple of articles and we're going to send these slides out, so don't feel you need to write down these giant URLs. Um, but we have a couple articles, how to do Twitter and how not to make some social media mistakes. So this should be helpful. Yeah, and, and you know, we get a lot of pushback. Well, actually, it's, a, it's all over the place about AVO. And we actually have an article in the newsletter. Um, and so, Laura, what, I mean, AVO, is AVO a lawyer's friend? Or is it? Are the, a lawyer's frenemy? I think it can definitely be a lawyer's friend if used correctly and also can not only among potential clients um, by answering their answering their questions but also among other attorneys by kind of building up their credibility and also leaving other uh, leaving reviews for their peers and that also boosts your rating so um, that's always always a good thing for Avo to have that higher rating. It's interesting because when I hear people complain about Avo, it's usually that their profile is not complete or it's no good or they have a negative review. But we certainly have way more clients talk about how awesome it is and how they got, you know, a, a case or a client from Avo or a, a client went to Avo to check them out. Mm -hmm. And so you can use it to your advantage. You know, it reminds me a lot, and these things come along. I mean, it's no different than social media in general coming along and people ignored that for a long time and said so that's, you know, unimportant. I remember back when lawyers didn't have websites and they didn't think that Google was important or the Internet was. And this is just one of those things that you have to embrace in the ongoing uh, world and life of marketing as it grows and different opportunities present themselves. It, other ones that used to be good go away. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, anyway, you have to take advantage of all these different things. It's, don't just turn your back on them. And there is a nuance to how you do it. And that was uh, Daniel's point about Twitter, uh, how are lawyers effective with Twitter? I think that many lawyers can be effective with Twitter. Um, I know some who are who are pretty good with it, like Jim Hacking. Yeah, I've and Ross Drewitz is Twitter. really good with uh, Twitter, a San Diego uh, attorney out there. And um, it just depends upon what what your game is. Some people prefer Twitter. Some people prefer Facebook. Hannah, who's our content manager, um, who's on here, right? I mean, she's a fantastic Twitterer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that second article there, the twenty one top t Twitter t tips. I can really say. Twitter tips, yeah. That's from uh, that's from Hannah, and she, on a bet with her husband, said that she would get more followers, and she actually turned into quite the Twitter guru. So she wrote an article for us. It's one of those very long, in-depth articles, and it did really well when we pushed it out. 
but it's great tips. If that's something you want to embrace, if that's something that's, uh, you know, you notice other that's active in your community, folks in your community use Twitter, then that may be something you want to check out. Yeah. All right, this is another one. You can look for uh, local media outlets who use social media in your area. You know, I live in a small town in Virginia, and all our local paper uh, is active on Facebook, and we also have some groups for living in the county where I live, and they're very active. So there's a lot of people talking about the area where I live, and it's probably going to be the same for you. So you can look for radio stations in your market that are active on social media. You know, check Facebook, check Twitter, see what they're doing. Local TV stations or even the individual broadcasters may have public pages. And also lo local publications, like I was saying, the newsletter type folks or uh, magazines, things like that, go out there and see if they have uh, active social media accounts. And what you can do is if they start talking about something in the news that's relevant to your area of practice, you can offer your op opinion, you can counter false information, offer your perspective, and you may actually find that they want to engage you as an expert. We actually had this happen recently with one of our clients, uh, Scott Grossman. Uh, he was listening to a news story about a national news that dealt with a probate case. And he said that the newscasters were saying untrue things. And it's a local radio station that he listens to. And so he reached out to them just to correct what they were saying, and they invited him to come on the air. So he now got a media appearance just from interacting with them. And you can do this through social media. I actually commented on a Wall Street Journal post once, and they uh, contacted me for an interview. And that's what happens. You've got to remember, the media outlets are using social media because they need content. So if you have a good opinion and you're an authority, they may want to reach out to you, and that's a great way for you to get uh, media exposure from these reporters who are monitoring what's going on on social media. That's super powerful juice to not only your website, you know, because that's what everybody talks about. It's like, how do I get, but just to your brand. Mm -hmm. Remember, that's what we're talking about is your overall brand, um, not just keywords. Get away from that whole thing, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about that, but the whole, let me focus on being on page one for X, Y, Z. It's really, you want to make sure that you're on page one and look good for your brand, your name. Because ultimately, it doesn't matter if you're on page one for some obscure keyword or some vanity keyword. Or ultimately, gonna you might be on page one for all those vanity keywords. But if you have a crappy reputation or you don't have good reviews or, or you're not on all these other places and people see that, then that's going to have a negative impact on your brand marketing. So all this stuff is very helpful to that, and it it, it stays with you. It's evergreen. You know, it's not like what's Google going to do today, or what's Google going to do tomorrow, and you're gone off. You know, indexing for your keywords. This is stuff that will stay with you. I just wanted to give one last example here. We mentioned how QP is very good with their products. They have bumper stickers and T-shirts and things like that. If you do that, or you give out bobbleheads, mugs. You know, we send mugs to uh, clients sometimes. And in this case, um, one of them sent us a picture, so we posted it on social media. And actually, these are the folks at Top Practices who we partner with. And so again, we tagged their business. We have the picture of uh, lovely, as is Leslie here Leslie with her mug. Catherine. And this got interaction with the company, and it got us in front of their clients and ours. And it was just a nice, it's a nice way. This is what you do with social media. And what you can do is if people, especially for bumper stickers, have them take pictures of their car with your bumper sticker, have them take a picture with a t-shirt, and then share it on social media. And uh, you can also share these things yourself. So if you post it to your business, you can share it to your own personal page where you may have other followers. It's just another way to extend, extend your reach and get in front of more people. All right. Jamie, this one's especially for you and what you've been going through with some of your clients. Oh, goody. So when you, this is for folks who have no focus in their content. So you're not, you're writing really generic content or you have too much. You're hyper-focused on your keywords. This is Jamie's pet peeve. So that's Go Jamie right Jamie. there. That's a cartoon version of you without a beard. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the scenario. You're using all of your favorite keyword phrases and all of your content everywhere. You're just going bonkers doing it. Or you write really generic high-level content with no clear focus or no geolocation so nobody knows where you're actually located. All right. So what happens? Your over-optimized pages where you have keywords everywhere start competing with themselves or if you're not really focusing at all, your pages are so general, you don't come up in searches for your area. So you want to tell us a little more about what you've seen? Uh, yeah, you know, for the longest time, it was encouraged because it was necessary to, when trying to optimize any piece of content, you would have to basically have the exact keyword that you were trying to target uh, 
you know, scattered throughout the article, you know, several times. There were very big debates about optimal keyword density for articles. Uh, you would have to have the keyword in particular places in the title, and it's better to have it at the front half of the title than at the back half of the title. Um, but as Google and to a certain extent the other search engines also have gotten smarter and have gotten better at understanding and reading more natural human speech patterns, uh, the focus has shifted away from that necessity of exact match keywords. Uh, but what can happen then is when we say that, sometimes people steer too far in the other direction. They say, well, keyword optimization is dead. It doesn't matter anymore. Uh, and that's not necessarily the case either. Um, of the two scenarios Danielle mentioned on the previous slide, either using all your favorite keywords everywhere or writing so generically that you're not showing up really at all for a particular keyword, uh, it sounds kind of stupid, but the answer is in between the two. And it, it sounds simple and it sounds dumb, but that's what you have to do. Some of the very fundamentals of SEO are still very much alive. You want to make sure that you have the primary keyword, and when I say keyword, I really mean keyword phrase. It's rarely going to be just one word. Uh, but you need that primary high-level keyword phrase in the title of your page, in the headline of the page or the H1 tag of the page. You need to have uh, well-written, concise, and keyword-friendly uh, subheadings to break up your content. If you have 1,200 words of content, um, you know that can be off-putting just visually for somebody looking for, as I mentioned earlier, the easily digestible pieces of online information. Uh, but if you break it up with subheadings that give people a sort of at-a-glance summary of the content that you're going over, it makes it more approachable to them, but it also, if somebody actually is in a super hurry for some reason, uh, can give them the information that, that they were searching for without having to read the entire piece of content. Um, I like to think of it as going back to writing class that you had in high school or college. A lot of these same principles apply. You want to be answering questions with the titles and headings and subheadings that you're using. Um, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be the exactly matched keyword phrase that you're trying to, to rank for with a particular piece of content, but it needs to be informative and be correct without being over-optimized or, or keyword stuffed or, or just sounding you know, generally bad. Poorly written just for SEO purposes. Yeah. yeah. Don't, don't forget basic writing fundamentals either. Any content that you publish should make your high school English teacher proud and not roll over in their grave. Right. Make sure you have an editor. If you're doing your own content, Lord knows we, <laughs> we have our share around here. So. If you need editing help, we can also <laughs> do that. We've had plenty of people with editing opinions. All right, we can move on here. Sure, and Jamie, I think you had talked about with a client recently that you had adjusted how they were using keywords in some of their key pages, uh, which helped their rankings. So I just have an example here, a basic website layout. You've got your home page, then you've got your main sections, which for us are like the, the service pages, the practice area pages, and then you have supporting content for each service area. So why don't you tell us about what you did for a client? Well, in this particular case, it was uh, the situation was they had very well written uh, content on their home page, and also uh, this particular client was an attorney, and they uh, had a couple different practice areas that they feature on the website, and a lot of great content there already pre-existing and had been there for years, uh, but we were missing opportunities in some of the the key fundamental. SEO areas that I uh, that I was just talking about the the title tag and heading of the pages using keywords effectively, and by just going in with I don't know half an hour or an hour's work for on these handful of pages and making sure that the keywords that we want these pages to be showing up for are used judiciously but also sort of in a restrained manner as well in the title and in the heading. Uh, you know, we were able to see very tangible gains in both overall traffic as well as organic search traffic over the past several months. Um, since I made those changes uh, about five months ago, uh, organic traffic to that particular homepage has gone up 20%, uh, while organic traffic to their practice area pages is up almost 50% at 47%. At the same time, total traffic overall to the site's up 35%, and unique visitors to the site are up 42%. Uh, and you cap that off with a 15% increase from the three uh, geographical areas that they have uh, home offices in. Those are great results just for making some 
pretty simple changes. Yeah, you know, the as we always like to tell people that Google's getting smarter and smarter every year and that the, the shift and trends are heading towards semantic speech and natural language, but it's not there yet. You know, we're still dealing with Siri. We're not dealing with the fake robot from uh, her. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we're not quite there yet. You still got to lead the horse to the water to a certain extent. Uh, so don't forget SEO fundamentals. Don't make it hard for Google to figure out what kind of business you are and where you're located. Jamie, just answer me this. That, that increase that you got for the client, how long did that take you about to do that, to get those kinds of results? For me to actually do the work, mm -hmm. I mean, like I said, maybe about an hour for three or four pages I was editing. You know, do a little bit of keyword research, make sure we're actually targeting the most valuable keywords. Uh, you want to marry that up with the existing content already. You don't want to shoehorn a keyword sure. that doesn't match the, the content. You know, in, in some cases, the difference between a search for personal injury attorney versus personal injury lawyer can produce very different, uh, 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 there can be a big difference in the amount of searches for one over the other over any course of time. So it's always a good idea to just double check those as you're going in uh, making changes like that. But uh, the, the key takeaway from this study was that the, you know, very easy to do and, and quick to turn around work can yield uh, you know, very good results for a long time. And that's organic results that will keep coming for, you know, for a while. And so if you're considering where do you want to spend your time or effort, you get a pro that knows what they're doing. They can do it faster and better than you can. Just like you're a lawyer, you know your business, you do it faster and better than I could do my own, you know, lawsuit or case or file bankruptcy or DUI or whatever else. And that's really the kind of point. So it's a better investment to get those kinds of things done than go spend money on pay-per-click or stuff you don't even know what's going on. Anyway, it's a good job, Jamie. All right, our next uh, mistake is, hey, why have a plan when you can just wing it? Woo! That's, that's exactly right, right? All like right. Most people do. Most people just wing it. They think it's easy. You're a great lawyer. Hey, this marketing can't be too hard. Right. So you just, uh, if you, you know, if you have a law firm or you have a, a medical practice, you know, you, you're a small business owner, and you have to do your job and see your patients and see your clients, but you also have to market what you're doing. So what oftentimes ends up happening is that you just quote unquote do marketing whenever you have time or when you feel like it, which frankly, if you're busy, isn't very often, or your marketing is very siloed or very disconnected. You hear, oh, I need to do content, so you write some content. Oh, I need to do social media, I'll go do some social media. But they're not connected and they're not integrated. You just don't really have an overall plan. And writing content is a lot harder than everybody thinks it is. I mean, that's, that's when I first got into this business, that's the first thing that I outsourced was some people could write the content because when I would get a web client, they would be like, oh, build me a website, and I would have to fill it up with content, which I struggled with greatly. It's not my skill. So find somebody that is skilled and loves to write because it is hard. And you're fooling yourself if you're not a writer, if you don't love it, and you think all of a sudden you're just going to start writing content for your website. You just need to be realistic about that. All right, so now if you don't have a plan, you're basically committing random acts of marketing. You may wake up one day and say, hey, I should write some content, or hey, I need some more clients. And then you end up wondering why nothing works. Or you have no idea what is working. So something may, you may all of a sudden find clients who are like, gee, I wonder where those people came from. You just don't know what's working. This is very important. <laughs> it is, and we have a lovely smiling picture of Dave Fries here, who is a uh, friend and client of ours. He is an estate planning attorney and motivational speaker and all-around fascinating human being. And he shared this with us recently. Uh, this is what he does for his own estate planning uh, practice. So this is a basic plan that you yourself can use. Basically what you do is just list out all of your service areas or your practice areas and any products that you also sell. List them all out. And for each one of those, you want to document what marketing have you done. Do you create content? Do you promote it on social media? Are you doing radio buys, TV ads? You know, what are you doing? And then you want to say, what are the results of each of these campaigns I've done for this service area? What did it cost me? How many new clients or patients did I get as a result of this? Just start documenting what you were doing. Then once you've written down what you've already done, you can start brainstorming new campaigns. You know, take a look at what's worked and what hasn't. Can you brainstorm something new? Uh, can you modify what you've done to make it better? 
and put those service areas or practice areas in order of importance. And the reason he said to put it in a list is sometimes you can focus on a couple of your practice areas and you kind of forget about the others. So you want to have it all down on paper so you can see everything you're doing and make sure you're hitting each practice area. Because if you're not marketing to your services and your products, you're not going to sell them. So make sure you're hitting each of them on a regular basis. And this is going to be time consuming. You actually have to sit down and put the effort into doing this documentation and on a quarterly basis reviewing it and making sure you have a plan to sell and market each product or service that you have. You just need to do it. There's just no other way. <laughs> just do it. A marketing it. plan. <laughs> Who knew? We also encourage you to create an actual marketing calendar. So once you have this wonderful plan, there are going to be tasks you have to execute for these campaigns. So identify what you need to do. You may need time to write copy. You may need time to work on your radio ads. You may need time to analyze the results. Make appointments with yourself. You know, book time with your own calendar. Uh, unfortunately, for many of us, we let these things go. It's a lot easier to uh, work on clients or see patients instead of spending time on your marketing. You need to devote you know, a certain percentage of your week to doing your marketing. So actually schedule time on your calendar and don't do other things. Keep that appointment with yourself. This is an investment in your future. It's an investment in your business. Yeah, be realistic though. Don't be like, all oh, Monday I'm going to do content. I mean, that's just not realistic. The phone's going to ring, assumably, and you're going to need to talk to clients. You're going to need to respond to email. You're going to have to react to things. But as Danielle said, you know, give yourself an hour a day or two hours a day, whatever you can do, whenever you're the, whenever really your brain is working the best, whether that's in the morning or at night. It just depends upon how you are. But would do that. I mean, like that will make the biggest difference. Um, and just getting into that habit of doing that. And what you'll do in that time will be dependent upon what's going on or what is in your marketing calendar, what's coming up. And when you're creating this calendar, we want you to think about what regular trends are important for your niche. And Jamie already talked about this, the, you know, noticing that the DUI cases spike on certain dates. Make sure you're ready for that. Make sure you've got marketing ready to go to capitalize on that increase in cases. You know, what other trends happen? We know most of you attorneys, if you handle dog bites, you know they happen over the summer. If you do plastic surgery, you probably know that, um, you know, moms are looking for the mommy makeover certain times of year to be ready for bathing suit season. So you know these things happen, so be prepared ahead of time with your marketing campaign all ready to go. We also want you to go research uh, national and local events that may be relevant to what you do and see if you can capitalize on it. We know that we have distracted driving months, or if you're a personal injury attorney, that's a big national campaign. You can leverage that in your community. You can go to high schools, for example, and promote safe driving. Um, you can do uh, speak in your community. So really, you can theme what you're doing for your marketing around these national and local events. You just piggyback on top of them. And an easy way to find out more about national and local events is by following these local and national media outlets through social media. So it all kind of comes back around. It's just a great idea wheel. <laughs> the idea wheel, I like that. <laughs> and uh, when you're making your marketing calendar and you're looking for these national events, you're looking at trends, make sure that you are thinking about all your different marketing outlets. Remember on that first few slides we were talking about using your social media, using your newsletter, uh, using your follow-up campaigns, everything you do, if you do media, if you do radio, print ads, whatever you're doing, use all those outlets to promote these things. Integrate them all into your marketing plan and your marketing calendar. All right, I think this is our last mistake. So we're doing this is all this the work. the biggest one, though. I mean, this is what we see the most often. <laughs> yep. So you're not measuring anything. You're just doing. So you never know what works, and you never know what doesn't work. Yep, so you're marketing your business, but you don't track. And I love this quote, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. Trouble is, I don't know which half. Yeah. So what happens here? You've got your precious time and all your hard-earned money that you're spending on doing marketing. You're just wasting it on those random acts of marketing because you don't know what's working. And the problem here, it's not just the waste of time and money. It's that you're not going to get better if you don't know what's working and what's not. Your campaigns aren't going to get better. You're not going to bring in higher quality patients or clients that are going to give you a better profit margin. You're just not going to get a better quality business from uh, just better business. And this is going to be very frustrating for you because you're going to feel like you're just doing, 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 like Sisyphus pushing the, the rock up and falling back down. You're just going to keep going in this cycle unless you start tracking what you're doing, figuring out what works, and, and do more of that and less of what's not working. And 
uh, previous slides where he said have a marketing plan and a calendar, that's, gonna, that's a step in the right direction. So the solution, you need to measure and track everything that you do to market your practice or your law firm. This is very true, and this next slide is just an example of the different kinds of outlets that you right. need to be paying attention to. And it's whose responsibility is it really to know whether you're getting good return on investment for your marketing? Is it the marketing company you've hired, or is it you as the individual that's in charge of your own business to know what's working? I mean, a lot of times, uh, we hear it all the time that, that our clients say, I have no idea. And we can't tell them because we don't have all of the information. Uh, usually they don't even understand where they're getting their best leads from. They think that, uh, well, the phone is ringing. Well, how is the phone ringing? You know, what are you doing to make the phone ring? Uh, is it uh, your print stuff? Is it your billboards? Is it your bus advertisements? Is it your website? These are questions that the owner of the business needs to understand and ask. And, and really, you know, your website is a funnel of measurement for those different things. If, you can, if you're able to send everybody to the website to get information or whatever, or if you have trackable phone numbers, these are all the things that you need to be paying attention to. So what's the solution here? Uh, if you post content, you need to check its performance. And Jamie, what were you saying this morning? There's no reason to not be tracking your marketing online. Uh, it's so easy. It's done for you already. Uh, you just got to log in and look at it. This uh, is Google Analytics you're talking about, right? Uh, yes. Any on-site stuff is, is measured without you providing any input to begin with. You just have to take the initiative to look at it. Uh, it's all there for you. There's no reason not to be taking advantage of it. Right, so if you're posting content to your website, you should know, is that content actually getting visitors? And if you do get visitors, are they actually from your target area? Because if you're getting a lot of people who aren't from the market you're actually targeting, that kind of tells you that you're not being focused enough in your content. Anna, is the page converting? Can you tell if you're getting leads from that page? Uh, and if you shared that page on social media, did you get any likes or did people come to the page and like it or, or tweet it out? You know, take a look at how it's performing. There's a lot of things that you can look at. And if you find a page that's doing really well, it's getting a lot of traffic, maybe people filled out the contact form on that page, try and figure out why. What made that page better or different than all the others? And if a page is not getting any traffic or not getting any conversion, try to figure out why. Again, is it not targeted enough, not focused enough? Maybe you have too many similar pages. You know, you need to do some analysis and do some digging. And to that end, I have a couple links here. And again, we're going to send the presentation out. But there's, we've got steps for performing a content audit, so you can try and figure out what content's working and what isn't, and prune things down. And then we have a link to the webinar, which goes over that in more detail. There could be all kinds of reasons why content isn't converting um, or converting. I mean, and you don't want to just assume that it's no good. I mean, we're doing that right now. I mean, like, a lot of times you could take different pieces of content that individually aren't performing well, but if you combine them together, uh, they'll perform that much better. So just don't assume that it's no good. Uh, sometimes adding a video can help it. Sometimes the video on there can hurt it. If the video is irrelevant to the content, it's a turn off. That doesn't mean that the content itself is bad. So you've got to go through several exercises to determine what to do to make this uh, improve better. All right. So another solution. You remember that marketing calendar we encouraged you to create? Each campaign you start, uh, measure it. We mentioned this before. But you do want to track how much you're spending. And please include your time. You know, your time is valuable. Any time that you spend on your marketing, you're not seeing patients, you're not seeing clients. So make sure you factor that into how much this is costing you. What kind of contacts are you getting from these different campaigns? You know, if you do a radio ad, you should know how many people came in through there. Uh, how many, so you may get a contact, but how many clients or patients actually sign up and give you business? You know, it's another number. And then how much money do you make? What's the profit on these new clients? So you can go back and say, all right, it cost me $1,000 to run this campaign. I need to actually be profitable. You don't just want to keep spending money and not getting any return. You may say, yay, I got two new, new patients, but if, it, if you break even or not, don't make up what you spent on that campaign, that was not a good use of your time. So you can actually calculate your return on investment for each campaign that you do, and that will really show you. The numbers will show you what's working and what isn't. Yeah, and if you're getting, we hear this a lot of times too, I'm getting a lot of referrals from my past clients or I'm getting a lot of referrals from people. Well, where are those coming from? And how are they getting there? Are they uh, past clients that are referring you because now you're marketing to them through your newsletter? 
or they're you know paying attention to you through social media, you just don't stop at oh they're, I'm getting referrals from past clients or from other lawyers. Well, why are other lawyers referring business to you? Is it because of your social media, or what is it? So you just need to explore that stuff. Another thing is that um, we get feedback from clients about oh well I'm getting a bunch of downloads or people are getting my book but I'm not getting any cases or I'm not getting any patients and so but you're you have a different kind of success you're generating a lead that's a different kind of success thought pattern that may in fact help you down uh, get more clients down the road so um, there's you just really need to measure pardon me Dave Fries is blowing up my phone this whole time so he must know that we're talking <laughs> he knows about we're him. talking about him <laughs> okay so uh, anyway, good stuff here. And we actually have a client who's been doing a great job over the years tracking their contacts. Right, Jamie? Isn't this one of your clients? Uh, yeah, they do a great job of tracking client intake. And I think you actually have Although a Although he doesn't think that they're doing a good job. We just talked to them, and he was like, I don't know. He, he thinks he could be doing better. And I suppose, to a certain extent, everybody could always be doing a little better. But we're very pleased with, right. with what he's able to do. Uh, because tracking intakes is difficult. If you get a new client or a new patient, and sorry, Danielle, if I'm giving it away, skipping a skipping ahead a few slides, but uh, you know, it's very easy to ask, "Oh, how did you hear about us?" When when uh, when booking a new patient or a new client, their answers could be anything. The internet might be their answer, and that's not helpful at all. The Google might be their answer, also not helpful at all. Um, so. Trying to get real data from people when asking how they heard about you can go both ways. Um, you know, somebody might say, "Oh, I heard you know your radio advertisement and went straight to the website." You know, that's very easy to keep track of. And that's very easy to track. Um, you know, when people don't know, uh, either just through ignorance or because they don't remember for whatever reason, uh, it can be more difficult to track. But the only way to guarantee failure is to not even bother asking. If you're only able to truly attribute the sources of, of half of the clients that you come in, that's 50% more than you would have if you hadn't done anything. And you can revise and improve your process over time. You know, there's no reason to not be doing these things is the takeaway. That's a great point, Jamie, and it's less expensive to ask the question than go jam another thousand dollars on pay-per-click. The other thing I want to point out is that if you're running a marketing campaign or a couple marketing campaigns, give that information to whoever does your intake so they know. You know, very often uh, what work you're doing doesn't get communicated to the front desk, and they may have no clue what's going on. So if somebody said, oh, I heard you on the radio, they'll be like, uh, okay. Uh, but if you tell them, hey, I've got these campaigns running from this date to this date, this is what you should expect, you know, work with the folks doing your intake so they know what to ask. They can probe as well, you know. If there are, you have two radio ads asking, they can try to inquire which one you heard. You know, they can be your friend. They can help you get this good marketing data that you need. Yeah, the last thing that you want is the person answering the person answering the phone to be surprised about why someone is calling. Right. Say, I just saw your ad. You know, I'm calling for the special oh, offer. What? what special offer? Yeah, what are you talking about? You must have the wrong number. And so, yeah, you and we have we have to do this ourselves about different things. We get in our own little marketing world and put stuff out that we have to tell the company about because. It can, you know, we've gotten in trouble from a lot of people, some people that are sitting in this room right now mm -hmm. that are glaring at me for doing marketing campaigns without informing them, you know, that they might be getting very busy quickly or that they're going to be answering questions. So you want to include your staff and anybody that's involved with what you're doing. Plus, they're, you know, seek out ideas from different people. They could be, uh, help you promote it to their own social circles. Remember, everybody that works for you, too, is really a marketing person in your firm now that social media is out there. They have their own list of people that pay attention to them, friends and family. I mean, you know, everybody that's got staff that's in a doctor uh, office or a, mark or a lawyer's office should be encouraging their, you, don't, you can't make them do it, but should be encouraging your employees to participate in what you guys are doing and get the word out there. People like to, to buy things and to work with people they trust and like. And friends, and you know, people always will ask for a referral first. If they can't find a referral, they'll usually go look. We have a couple more things we're tracking, and we are getting short on time. So we just want to make the point: we made this last month. Uh, if you're sending out an email newsletter, or you have an email follow-up campaign, or if you use vanity URLs for your marketing, make sure that you're doing uh, tracking. We have a link here to the Google URL builder. It's very easy to do. 
you'll just end up with a link that looks like what we have here, and you just use this hyperlink in your the links you put in that newsletter, that follow-up campaign. And you can set this up if you use GoDaddy, for example, if you use a vanity URL, you can actually put tracking in there so you'll know where people came from when they click those. And this is very informative to your analytical person, like Jamie or Laura or whoever is working on it. Um, so that you know what's working or what doesn't, and that's, here you go, that'll show up in Google Analytics. And this is, this is our, um, our newsletter. Just an example of some of the different things we've done that are tracked. Yeah, so, that, that, so we know if the traffic's coming in, how do you know? Uh, if you don't track it, that's the whole point. You can also see how engaged those people are, how right. much time they spend on the site, things like that. So it just tells you how successful those campaigns and are. We're, it, we're, the whole point is just trying to get better. I mean, you know, it's incrementally get better or figure out what you did wrong. So if you, if, if you have a trend of doing really well with your email newsletter and all of a sudden you have a really, you know, bad month, what did you do that there? Not only what did you do better, but what did you do wrong? Let's not do that anymore. You know, so that's the other thing that it can tell you. And then we pretty much already covered yeah, this, about this, asking about how did you hear about us. And uh, one thing I will mention is that uh, we do recommend you record your calls. Uh, this isn't going to help you measure, but it is a good way to keep an eye on what's going on in your uh, market. And Laura's here softly clapping. We like this. Um, you may not realize it, but you could be losing leads and losing business that you're paying a lot of money to bring in because of the person answering the phone is rude or discourteous or just not helpful. So you want to listen to those calls and see if you can help them be better, give them better information at the front desk. What was a big blow about Comcast just recently that was in the news about their... Yeah, their... they had that horrible customer service call mm -hmm. that got recorded. Yeah, I mean, like, this is what happens. And so, you know, what do you think that you it's not going to happen in your firm? I mean, uh, what happens while you're off doing depositions? Um, and, you know, you have a disgruntled employee that doesn't really care about how successful you are or not, um, especially if you're hiring cheap labor. You need to be very careful about this and pay attention to what's going on when people are actually calling you. And it's not just it's not just to you know babysit the people who are working for you. It's really a chance to make it better, so you can offer coaching and offer advice to actually make them better at their job. So it's really a positive. So this is just a summary slide uh, of everything we talked about: fixing your marketing. Make sure that you're if you write content or you have an offer on your website, make sure you're actually promoting it. Embrace the social in social media. Get out there and get social. We also want you to focus on your key landing pages and write great supporting content. Don't go nuts with your keywords, but like Jamie said, be uh, more deliberate in their use. Uh, create a plan and a marketing calendar and actually stick to it. You know, having any plan is better than none. Just get started. It's going to be really hard at first. It is always hard to inject this new kind of discipline, but if you keep at it, keep scheduling time for yourself to do your marketing, it's going to get better. And then, of course, track and measure. And then, uh, well, thank you very much. Do we have any questions from anyone? Uh, we had a question about the best, best way to track intake, but we answered it, he said. Let's see. And then we have a question about the video package that we're offering, so we can go to the last slide. So at the Great Legal Marketing Summit coming up in October, uh, somebody asked about our video package. We're offering a video package for 3500 and he's asking, can we do any topic or should it be narrowed? And yes, you can shoot the videos in any topic you want. All videos, whatever you yep. want. You have an hour-long shoot, so it's completely up to you what you do. As far as writing the content, uh, once you shoot the video, we will write the content that goes on the video page for you. And how many people can be in the video? I don't think we have a limit. I think it's really the number of videos in one hour green screen. So if you want to appear... Well, that depends. I mean... Well, not 14. But. Right. You're not gonna like, <laughs> we it just depends on what kind of video you're trying to shoot. So... Yeah, you're more than welcome. Mark, if you want to reach out to us, uh, we can answer your specific questions, you know, if you have yeah, an idea of what you want to shoot. Anna, when, when should you register? Okay, we'll go ahead and shoot you an email. Yeah. And then, of course, um, we're here to help. Uh, if you're looking, if you're not already a client, you're looking to for a change, you want to work with a U.S.-based company that really only practices white hat SEO and we just had one of our guys, Zach, who came back from MozCon last week and, you know, reported to us that we're doing all the right things and gave us some, some other tips on what the, the pros out there are doing. So we're always staying in the know about what's going on. Uh, of course, uh, our annual big summit is October 24th through uh, the 26th, really, if you include our boot camp, which is uh, here in Arlington, the same hotel that it's been in the last couple of years. It's a very popular venue within walking distance of Reagan, uh, Ronald Reagan. I have a hard time saying it's that. Just it's just National Airport. So it's DCA. So we hope to see you there. Uh, we'll 
putting on more presentations like this and other cool stuff to help you. And of course, our boot camp is on the 26th, the day after the summit. Uh, you can get more information about that. And what the pricing on that is 3.99 for the boot camp. Yes, till the end of August is 3.99, and you don't have to be attending the Great Legal Marketing Conference. Of course, we encourage you to. But if you just want to come out for the one day boot camp, you certainly can. It's from 9 to 5, that's Sunday, October 26th. And we have a page on our website about it, fwmbootcamp.com. Very good. And we're uh, out of time, but Danielle, how, what are we going to do? How are we going to get this information to everybody? Uh, we are going to send this recording and versions, a uh, copy of all the slides to everybody. So look for that in your mail either today or tomorrow. And then we'll be sending out information about our next August webinar. Uh, so look for that too. And we had a couple more questions, but um, I think we're out of time. We can send contact these folks individually. Yeah, if uh, we didn't get your question answered online here, we'll send, it, we'll send a response, and we'll put those responses in the email. Okay, everybody, thank you very much for your time. And uh, 201, not bad. <laughs> okay, everybody, and I look forward to seeing you guys or um, speaking to you on the next webinar. Thank you very much, Danielle, Jamie, and Laura. Thanks, Tom. Take care. Thank you. Thanks.